I received my PhD from the University of Rochester in the history department. The teachers were all men. I never had a female instructor in my, four, in my uh, six years of training. Uh, I read very few texts by women. I read nothing, nothing was ever assigned on women's history. In fact, when I put um, Mills on the subjection of women on my reading list, I was told to take it out. Uh, it was not his best text. And, and I mean, the, the important thing is that I took it off. You know, I, I noted it, but okay, I'll take it off. But the, what, what characterized these men, and this is kind of getting back to Deborah Cohen's question earlier today, was, were that they were iconoclasts. They were intellectually adventurous. They were arrogant. They were self-absorbed. But they were very permissive. Um, a number of them were disaffected uh, intellectuals of Cold War America. Some of them were still had left-wing commitments such as Haratunian and Gutman, but others you know, just positioned themselves, I guess like White, as a disaffected intellectual. There was nothing dignified about history, and there was certainly no subject that was not dignified enough to be an historical subject, okay? So um, here's the pedagogy they delivered. Uh, their treatment of me was I would call, describe as benign neglect. Uh, no guidance in professional advancement, very little or no line editing, no guidance about how to write letters of application or a vita. Um, the closest thing I received to professional mentoring uh, was uh, uh, one conference with uh, Hayden White, who I, I really worked with pretty closely uh, before he took off for other parts. Uh, after I had participated in a seminar, been rather quiet, but produced a good paper, classic female student, right? He said, your problem, Mrs. Walkowitz, was that you're not, ar that your problem, Mrs. Walkowitz, is that you're not arrogant enough. Uh, and I was very <laughs> struck by that statement. And I think he meant it very well. He was really trying to tell me how to play this game and how you have to pursue, per, uh, assume a certain persona and uh, a certain aggression, intellectual aggression and self-confidence to get on in life. Uh, and he meant well. But um, the permissiveness, I think, was also very important. Here, once again, it's Hayden White who is, whose quotes are kind of coming up uh, into my mind. And I think his greatest gift to me, but which I think was the ethos of the whole department, was the statement, you can do whatever you want as long as it's interesting. And for the 60s, that was very enlightened and very liberating. But the problem, of course, was to figure out what was interesting, because they weren't going to tell me. And there I had to turn my attention outside. And uh, it was 1967, 1968. A lot of things were happening outside. And I made the classic move. Um, uh, from student politics, civil rights, anti-war, women's liberation movement. And uh, for the two years, let's say, between 1967 and 69, I was working with um, welfare rights uh, mothers. And what I wanted to do was an historical subject that involved feminist cross-class alliances. And that's what got me to, first to Britain and to the Contagious Diseases Acts. That's how, I went that route, and I also followed what, what was the cross-class alliance. It was prostitution. That wasn't my subject. It was their subject. One of the differences in our stories is that mine would definitely start in college, not in graduate school, and that began first. So I went to Brown in 1982, and I didn't realize this until I'd been there for a while. I thought it was normal that there were so many female professors at Brown in 1982 because there were so many female teachers in my high school. It just seemed like a continuity. I wasn't very savvy about higher education or how it worked. But um, I later, later found out that I had arrived in Brown soon after the effects of something called the Lamphere decision had taken place. How many people here 
So, okay, I, I'll explain it then, because some people know, but not everybody. So, Louise Lamphere was an anthropologist who was denied tenure. I only really know the apocryphal version of the story, which is that she then sued, and it's always difficult in those suits to prove actual bias. But somebody slipped her, and in, in the mythical version, I think it was a member of the staff, because of course the staff were female, and she was, you know, got along better with them and was more considerate of them than a lot of her male colleagues. So someone slipped her all these documents that indubitably proved that there had been bias, gender bias. And rather than get a settlement just for herself, what she asked was that the university hire a certain number of tenure, to hire and tenure or hire as tenured a certain number of women by a certain date. And I was the beneficiary of that. Because the first thing I would say about mentoring was that there's a certain amount of mentoring that goes on just by example, which is why gender equity and gender parity are really, really important. It is absolutely the case that men can effectively mentor female students, but it's really not great to be in a situation where there's only one gender in a position of authority. And that was not my experience. I saw women faculty all the time, running classes, running departments, and that made me feel in a way that I had never actually thought before that this was something that I myself could do. When I arrived at Brown, it was also a moment of high, uh, high feminist ferment. The Pembroke Center had started its seminar. It was a very interdisciplinary feminist moment, at least at Brown. I think that that might also be due to the Lamphere decision. I don't know if it was a stipulation, but certainly the way it worked out, the female faculty weren't all in one department. They were spread across departments. And so there were a lot of ties being made across departments, and the Pembroke Center was a place where historians and people in literature, people in sociology, and Fausto Sterling, so people from science studies, were all coming together and would have these disciplinary arguments that at a school that had no requirements were sometimes a bit opaque to the undergraduates because we, at Brown, I think uh, undergraduates aren't very strongly identified with disciplines, but in a way, I learned what disciplines were by listening to people argue across disciplines about what a historian might bring to what a, a, the historical critique of a certain kind of trans historical position. So in the, I don't think this was everyone's experience of Brown, but my experience of Brown was that feminism was at the center of the universe. There was a women's center that was doing a lot of activism and there were lots of women's study. I didn't actually do a women's studies concentration, but I took a lot of women's studies courses. And even the classes I took that weren't feminist courses, I turned into feminist courses. Everything I learned was filtered through feminism. 